Revolutionary Talk for Revolutionary Times. Promoting peace, liberty, and prosperity around the clock. LibertyTalk.fm. Welcome to another edition of Liberty with Love with Robin Kerner. Thank you for being with me. It is a pleasure, as always. A few weeks ago, if you are a regular listener to the show, you will know that I spoke to a gentleman called Yatsik Spendel, and I was speaking to him in... um he was in Phoenix, actually, at the Goldwater Institute. And today I am speaking to the director of litigation at an organization that might be called the Goldwater Institute of Tennessee. He actually works for the Beacon Center of Tennessee that is doing great work to preserve our basic rights, or rather the basic rights of Tennesseans, the liberties of Tennesseans. And uh, just before this show started, I was talking to Braden, and um, we thought it'd be pretty cool to frame this show as a bit of a discussion of um, the value of state constitutions in, if only they're taken out of their boxes, metaphorically, in protecting the liberties of Americans across the country. So, uh, Braden, thank you very much for being with me on this show. I'm kind of excited to have this discussion with you. Now I'm excited to be here. Now, where should we start? Should we start with this, lit, uh, this litigation victory that you had? Um, because this sure. was how you came to me um, when I found out about you, that, uh, with uh, defending the, the right of a property owner, I believe, to conduct an Airbnb in their home, right? That's right. Yeah. Okay, let's talk about that as kind of a way into the more kind of general stuff we're going to speak about. So what is this win that you've just had? And, and as we're talking about it, um, kind of tie it up with uh, what it is that you as, a, as an organization uh, are about. Sure. Well, we represent a young couple um, who were, have been airbnb their house for years. The, we're in Nashville, and um, the husband is a musician, so they're on the road a lot. They travel, and their house is available. And, um, you know, they're young. They don't have a whole lot of benefits or disposable income. But Airbnb, uh, they, when they discovered it, it really filled in the margin, and they figured they're gone anyway, and life's great. Um, the neighbors never complained. It was a great experience mm-hmm. all the way around. But a couple of uh, about a year and a half ago, Nashville decided that this was a problem um, and began cracking down on these things and put some really aggressive limitations in place for people's ability to uh, do an Airbnb in the privacy of their own home. And uh, this dovetails with our greater mission because you know we believe very much in limited government and property rights. And we saw this as an opportunity to really assert those principles. Um, and we went to court and did so. And uh, it was an exciting opportunity. I mean, you know, I realized that Airbnb is new and, um, you know, as with any new, many new things on the marketplace, people have sort of heartburn about where it's yeah. going and what it leads to. But, you know, the, it, I really don't think it's very different than the Uber taxi cab scenario. Um, we found in the course of the litigation that there was great interference by um, market participants who were upset that their business model was getting disrupted by people, um, Airbnb. And, uh, you know, the other um, kind of compelling point that I like to make to people is, you know, we just had a really long national discussion that I think is more or less at the end where we decided that what people do in their bedrooms is nobody else's business. Mm. Why is it why is it anybody's business what people do with their bedrooms? I like that. That's a all good. you changed. All you changed is a preposition. All right, that's that's fantastic. Now, did you? That's kind of a good line for public consumption, right? In terms of like the PR campaign, I I, I can imagine that worked. Um, was there a big PR campaign, or was this something that you were just using in the courtroom, as it were? We, we did do a, um, you know, we we our website. We really work very hard to try and tell these people's story and have yeah. people identify with them. I mean, these are a young couple raising their family. You know, they don't have like a lot of young people. They don't have regular jobs with benefits the way that you know we conventionally think of jobs. Mm-hmm. And 
the new economy has moved us away from those kind of jobs. And for them, you know, this is an opportunity that's presented by the new economy. Absolutely. And I think it was really risable for them to see, you know, people at chains of the older economy denying them the benefits of the new economy because the jobs didn't look like the jobs of the old economy. Sure. I mean, they were never going to have a job with benefits. Um, yeah. that, nothing, nothing's changed about that. So don't let them not get the good out of this just because it's not what it used to look like. I love it. Um, you mentioned uh, Uber as well. Uh, early, maybe it was before we started this interview. Um, what's the si- Are they having difficulty down there in Nashville and or Tennessee more broadly? Because I know so, it's different, yeah. isn't it, across the country. They've, they're, they're, yeah. they're having bigger fights in different places, yeah. Yeah. So we did have an Uber war um, a couple of years ago, uh, with, and the cities were – coming up with a patchwork of, of uh, different types of legislation regulating these things. It wasn't as bad as some cities, but um, we actually uh, worked and recommended a uniform law that basically um, was one statewide law that lets Uber operate with yeah. sensible restrictions on you know safety and driver's licenses and those sorts of things. And uh, actually, it's been it's been really great. I mean, you know, one of the benefits from it is that right after we got the law passed and kind of level the playing field on that front. Lyft announced that they were moving uh, some of the regional headquarters and their jobs to Nashville and uh-huh. specifically said, you know, that's the reason why. Actually, now going back to the litigation with the Airbnb thing, um, I find this whole sharing economy fascinating. Did you, were you um, in the business of actually getting laws and or regulations then changed? Is that, was that the outcome of the work that you did or was there some other outcome? That's definitely very much what we do, and we envision our litigation as being part of that. I mean, you can win two ways with litigation the way we do it. You know, you can win in the courtroom and have the judge declare a law unconstitutional, or you can drive the public discussion to such a degree that that there's a legislative change that gets you what you want. And we'll take our wins any way we can get them. And in fact, you know, Nashville is actually working right now to change the law to address the lawsuit. Um, that would effectively, uh, you know, fix the law to address what the law was declared unconstitutional for by the judge. And this is going to be the third time, actually, that they've done this. The judge is kind of there's been two, three, three times the judge has been like, look, what you're doing is unconstitutional on First Amendment grounds, Fourth Amendment grounds. And then the last was 14th Amendment grounds. And each time they've done it, they've gone back and they've had to amend or repeal their law to uh, address the constitutional issues. And none of that would happen without my clients being right. willing to um, lawsuit. Okay, so this is a great uh, way into, you know, I wanted to kind of frame this with like, uh, you know, the value of these uh, state constitutions that if you like, uh, underutilized, uh, right? So so let's talk a little bit of, about that. Um I mean, Scott, that's such a huge topic, isn't it? It's such a huge topic. Sure. Is this, is what you're doing in this respect new? No, absolutely. It's not new. I mean, it's, I think it's, it's an emerging issue, um, particularly among conservatives and libertarian types. Um, But even amongst them, I wouldn't say we invented it. The Institute for Justice has been Mm, doing these kind of lawsuits for a while. And Goldwater uh, has been doing them for a while too and I really think Goldwater really blazed the trail with the state constitution um, yeah. component of it and looking for claims in your state constitution that might not be available in your federal constitution um, but uh, it's very new I think for um, state based organizations um, I think we've reached a point of breakout I mean since I've been doing this job I've had many many organizations contact me being like Hey, we're a conservative organization. We've been pushing for laws in our state for years. We want to get in the litigation game. How do we do it? Um, and so you're starting to see these sorts of uh, organizations pop up. Um, I know an organization in Mississippi recently started doing litigation as well. Um, and I think it's just going to be more and more common. We've only got about a minute and a half left in this segment, Braden. But can you say briefly what what was the law that was unconstitutional with respect to this Airbnb that had to be uh, addressed again by the legislature? Yeah, the, 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 what the judge actually was concerned about, and this wasn't the totality of our challenge, what the judge was concerned about and struck it on was the law does not apply to hotels, bed and breakfast and boarding houses. You can imagine why. Um, it was very specific and aimed at Airbnbers. 
But if you actually go to figure out what is an Airbnb versus a hotel, a bed and breakfast, or a boarding house, the definitions are completely synonymous. Um, and so it subjects them to uh, the possibility of entirely arbitrary enforcement, where one day you're a hotel and the next day you're um, subject to an entirely different set of laws because you're an Airbnb. And the, the, what really I think was the problem is that this was not just theoretical. Um, before they passed this law, the city decided that they wanted tax dollars, and so they arbitrarily categorized all Airbnbers as running hotels and then levied a hotel tax on them. Mm. And so every time we went to court and, you know, the, the city would say, look, they're not hotels. Everybody knows they're not hotels. That we could very easily say, well, why were you asking – why were you taxing them like they were hotels? They were hotels when you wanted money. Right. Um, but they're not hotels when you're trying to get out of this lawsuit. And I think that was ultimately – very persuasive to the judge. Okay, this is great. That's a well timed, Braden, because we're coming to the end of the first segment. So we're going to talk more about your great work after the break. This is Liberty with Love with Robin Kerner. <laughs> You're listening to Liberty with Love. I'm Robin Kerner. I am speaking to Braden Busek, the director of litigation at the Beacon Center of Tennessee. When we went into the break, Braden, we were talking about this uh, case that you won um, or helped win f- uh, regarding the practice of Airbnb in in Nashville. Right? Specifically in Nashville, we're talking Tennessee. Uh, yeah, in Nashville. Nashville. Um, so now. But again, before the show, we were talking about the idea of exhuming the state constitutions um, and the potential importance of doing so for, you know, protecting the liberties of Americans everywhere in the country. Does, can you relate what was going on in this case to that idea? Let, let's talk first about the fact that you said that the judge who um, heard the case pointed out that, uh, that, that there was a the, – the, the, the government, I guess, of – is it, we're talking about the city government of Nashville was yep. acting against the federal constitution with respect to a number of amendments. So we'll talk about that. And then let's talk about the, the, the state constitutional angle that you took in that case as well. Sure. Um, well, you know, the, the ruling about how unclear the law was was rooted in the 14th Amendment of the U.S. Constitution. There's a state analog, but they're basically the same. It mm-hmm. amounted to a federal constitutional claim. Um, but you have a right to not have laws that are so vague you don't know if they apply to you or not. Um, and that was really what did the law in in this case. We, we had a, a, a good example of a state constitutional claim in there um, that is personal interest to me and um, you know certainly one we're going to be pushing forward. And there's no analog in the U.S. Constitution. Okay. Tennessee's got a constitutional provision that says perpetuities and monopolies – are contrary to the genius of a free state and shall be prohibited. Um, so, I mean, it's just squarely concerned with classical liberal economic thought, um, yeah. which isn't entirely surprising. I mean, the Tennessee's Constitution was written in 1796. You know, there were it was frontiersmen coming across the Appalachian Mountain from North Carolina. They wanted to till the land, farm the land. Um, you know, and in fact, one of the long train of abuses mentioned in the Declaration of Independence was that the British had placed restraints on settlement west of the Appalachians. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. um, and, you know, that's Tennessee. Mm-hmm. Uh, and so, you know, this was something that was very much of concern to the people who came out here. So, I mean, economic concerns were paramount um, to the people who wrote the Tennessee Constitution. And so they wrote this provision, which is just incorporates free market theory directly into the U.S. Con- uh, the state constitution. And for lawyers, this is very significant, and I'll explain why. The reason why is, generally speaking, the United States Supreme Court says the United States Constitution does not embody any particular form of economic thought. Um, And therefore, governments are free to do whatever they want to in the economic realm, and citizens are essentially helpless to come in and make constitutional claims against them. It is impossible to make that argument with respect to the Tennessee state constitution because of the anti-monopolies clause and some other clauses, too. But where the rubber hits the road on this case is the way that Nashville handles its Airbnb permits is that um, for non-interoccupied, that is, you don't, don't live there, Um, there's a hard cap on the number of permits. So for a particular neighborhood, only um, a certain percentage of people can get these permits. And once that that permits are issued, they're done. 
Nobody else can get them, and you can hold them in perpetuity. Now, hmm. when you've got an exclusive right to deal in a valuable economic realm and you're protected from any kind of competition, what would you call that? Yeah, yeah, monopoly. right. So it's a monopoly. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Yeah, yeah. Um, and according to the that's Tennessee Constitution, that's contrary to the genius of a free state and shall be prohibited. I've got to say, I just love the wording of contrary to the genius of a free space state, isn't it? Isn't that beautiful? Yep. It's like the King James Bible of state constitutional language. I, I just love that. It's gorgeous. Yeah, it yeah. is gorgeous. And, and you know, I, as somebody that spent a lot of time with the anti-monopolies clause and where mm. it came from and all those sorts of things, you know, it's it's remarkable. There's 200 years of Anglo thought embodied in that statement. You know, I mean, Adam Smith talked a lot about monopolies. Yes. Uh, and, uh, you know, really what he was talking about, he, he talked about monopolies a lot. And, and, you know, we use monopolies, we think of standard oil or whatever, or those sorts of examples. You know, and that's really wasn't a live example in Adam Smith's life. Right. You know, I, one of the things that Adam Smith said was one of the most pernicious forms of monopolies was um, apprenticeships, you know, the required guilds, you know, the requirement that, that before you can become a blacksmith, you have to have served, get a, be an apprentice right. for three years for this guy. And then after you're done, you can become a blacksmith. And he called that a form of monopoly. Mm. Um, and this is relevant because this sounds an awful lot like what we consider occupational licensure to be, you know, the requirement that you've got to have a license to braid hair, you know, or in Tennessee, we've got a license that before you can wash hair, you have to get a license. Now let's talk, let's, let's talk, let's talk about that because I know that also bears on a specific case that you've been involved in as well down there, right? So that's a great segue. So let's, let's go right ahead to that. Yeah. Well, in Tennessee, you have to have a license to wash hair. It's literally just shampoo hair. You have to go to school, get 300 hours of training on, and I'm quoting the law now, the theory and practice of shampooing. Um, oh, my God. And, you know, the regulations <laughs> detail what you learn. You learn such things as um, uh, OSHA regulations, EPA regulations. They teach you how to answer the phone. That's actually written in the regulation. Um, how to deal with customers. They teach you uh, how to deal with a blood spill incident. Um, so it's just this ridiculous amount of busy work, all designed to uh, to limit the number of people who can engage in this. And that's what they've done. Um, our litigation has shown that there's exactly 36 licensed people in the state of Tennessee who can wash air. And the Bureau of Labor says that the hourly wages for Tennesseans washing hair are highest in the nation by a considerable margin it's 15 dollars an hour in tennessee to wash air and we don't have a minimum we only do not have a minimum wage here so that's really really high the yeah. next highest is new jersey at about 10 dollars an hour and so you know we've got an any monopolies clause in there and you know it's kind of interesting because you do have you know the the other side saying look this is not a monopoly because anybody can get the license and of course they're using the term monopoly in the very modern sense mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And the argument that we've been having is like, look, if you go back and look at what like Adam Smith was talking about um, and, you know, Blackstone and these Anglo scholars from from that were roughly contemporary with them, this is exactly the sort of thing that they were talking about when they used the word monopoly. And how does that go down in in a courtroom? Do are judges interested in that? It's almost like you're taking kind of an originalist approach to Absolutely. to yeah. the Tennessee uh, Constitution. You know, and, and, and good. So, yeah. And good for you. Um so well, how does that play in a courtroom? You know, um, it, it's it's too new to say, right? Like we're okay. still waiting for rulings from the judge on this issue. So I don't know how how the, if the judge is going to buy this or not. Um, but we intend, and this is the purpose of organizations like ours, is we're after the precedent as much as anything. Yes. And so you know, we fully intend on pushing this question to the highest court we can and getting this question ruled. And, you know, we're not asking for money. Time is not, you know, you can't wait us out. You can't buy us off with a settlement. Mm. Like we're going to keep pushing this question um, and putting it in front of judge after judge until we can finally get somebody to say, you know, you're right. The Tennessee Constitution clearly protects economic liberty and prohibits monopolies. And monopolies meant what they meant to Adam Smith. And you're, um, if you've just got a minute before this, this segment closes out, but you're taking this fight into the courtroom and into the, you know, the public square too, right? I mean, you have a PR Absolutely. part of this. 
Yeah, no, our the, the shampoo case in particular has generated massive amounts of national headlines. Um, it's been covered from the Wall Street Journal to the Washington for uh, to the USA Today. I mean, it's just it's gotten a great deal of coverage. Um, and people, I mean, it's because it's outrageous. It brings mm. tremendous amount of shame to the state, frankly, in my opinion. And um, what about the uh, poli- you know the politicians? Is there are they feeling as much shame as they should? In the last 15 seconds of the segment, are you starting to see them squirm in their seats? It's been interesting. I, you know, I think that the politicians are eager. I've seen several politicians. We've got a governor's race coming up, and several of them have mentioned this law um, as something that they intend on doing something about. So we have, we've definitely driven the conversation on it. Brilliant. Okay, we're going into the second break. We will be back shortly. <laughs> Stairway Press is pleased to announce the publication of Robin Kerner's first book, If You Can Keep It, Why We Nearly Lost It and How We Get It Back. Jeffrey Tucker in the book's forward wrote, We seek to end government as we know it, but that is not the whole of what we seek. We also favor something beautiful. Explaining what this looks like and the rhetorical apparatus that necessarily accompanies this is the greatest value of Kerner's book. Barry Farber, award-winning talk show host, wrote, Robin Kerner's political, psychological, and philosophical rampage through today's America, turning on lights we didn't even know were off, takes more and more of your intellectual breath away according to how high you rated intellectually in the first place. Chris Ann Hall, constitutional attorney and educator, says Robin Kerner is a defender of liberty and a true lover of America's constitutional republic. The knowledge that Robin brings to his readers is sure to be instrumental in the restoration of our American foundational principles. If You Can Keep It by Robin Kerner, published by Stairway Press. Go to ifyoucankeepit.us for your pre-ordered, personally signed copy. I love these uh, discussions, Braden, that give me some optimism, you know, that it ain't all over in America, you know, that we're fighting back, we're reclaiming our liberties and having a few important victories. Before we started this interview, we were talking and you used this wonderful phrase, um, exhume the state constitutions. And let's talk more generally about... The, the potential impact of doing just that across maybe all the states of America um, and how we go about it. I mean, obviously, you're an organization like Goldwater that is kind of blazing a trail with respect to making that so. Um, but let, let's talk about that more generally. Sure. Um, well, you know, uh, starting off, I mean, if you think about it, the United States is designed to be a federal system. Um, and when the people who wrote the Constitution – you know, they didn't envision the relationship with the federal government and the citizenry being anything like what it is today, where, sure. you know, that's the primary government you think of. You know, your state government was predominantly where you were going to relate to as a citizen. Um, and so when they wrote the U.S. Constitution, you know, the Bill of Rights is pretty short. It's 10, 10 rights enumerated, um, and they include things like quartering troops, you know, which really <laughs> aren't live issues anymore. Um and so there's not a, you know, as a matter of practical constitutional jurisprudence, there's not a lot of opportunity to assert individual liberty there. And it's not because the people who wrote the Constitution weren't concerned with it. They thought the United States government was never going to be big enough to do things like we see our government doing right now because they'd place limitations on their power. Now, of course, that's not true. And to just warp through 200 years of constitutional law – um, when you get to the progressive era and um, the New Deal, you know, the courts were the last holdout on the expansion of the regulatory state. And, um, you know, FDR essentially intimidated the, uh, the United States Supreme Court until such a point in time where they said, OK, well, we basically do not recognize any economic liberty protected by the U.S. Constitution. And then wheeling into the progressive era – the states pretty much followed suit with all of that. You know, they just were singing the different tune. But this is not the way it's supposed to be. Hmm. I mean, you know, the people, the men and women, I mean, who wrote the U.S. Constitution went home and then participated. They either already had state constitutions or they participated in the drafting of new state constitutions. And those were going to be much more expansive in the protection of liberty because they thought that's where individuals and government were most going to be interacting. And so there's all sorts of things that have an analog to the U.S. Constitution, but also things that have zero analog to the U.S. Constitution. Um, And, you know, the the Tennessee Constitution, for instance, um, 
you know, it begins with its first three provisions. It, it actually puts the, the, its equivalent to the Bill of Rights, the Declaration of Rights, first. And they were making a statement with that. Yeah. You know, the Bill of Rights is an addendum to the U.S. Constitution. They said, we're putting it first. And the first couple of things it says are classic Lockean principles, right? Like sovereignty originates with the people. Um, you know, the only legitimate government, the only legitimacy government has is as given to them by the people, and the people shall retain the right to take it back at any point in time. And then get this. The second thing it says is that, the, and I'm quoting now, the doctrine of non-resistance to arbitrary power is slavish and absurd and shall be prohibited. Oh, wow. And it goes on to affir- not affirmatively condone revolution to make it the individual obligation of every citizen to overthrow a government that becomes absurd and slavish and uh, oppressive. So it, it, it actually contains in it a mandate that you revolt if the mm. government becomes tyrannical. Um, and, you know, there's nothing like that in the U.S. Constitution. <laughs> Absolutely. Uh, but, go ahead. No, I was going to say, I wonder how many other state constitutions are similarly, you know, have to take a similar approach. I bet, I bet the number isn't zero. I bet there's a few. Yeah, the number's not zero. Uh, and, you know, Tennessee's constitution is almost like a greatest hits. You know, it was one of the first ones drafted after the 13, the 13 colonies. Ah. And, so, and it was done by frontiersmen in three yeah. days. It was very rough. So it really is like a greatest hits. Like they just pull the, the best of Pennsylvania and North Carolina and so on and so on. But and I've only studied other state constitutions a little bit, mm. and it, you know some of that stuff is pretty common. I don't know of another state constitution though that requires their citizens to engage in armed revolution um, if this if the government becomes tyrannical. Yeah, how do you how do you put the very idea, um, let alone the contents of a lot of a um, an active, if you like, state constitution back into the culture. Because, I mean, I talk a lot on this show about culture preceding politics, right? And for something to have a political impact, I mean, it needs to kind of be in the thoughts of a large number of people in the yeah. society. Um, but, you know, there's something, I guess, to most people, state constitution it would be to sound like arcane and a bit an old bit yeah. of paper, right? So how do you, um, how do you kind of go about that? Well, you know, most people just don't think about the state constitution. Right. right? Yeah. Or to, the, to the degree that they do, they just assume it's like the U.S. Constitution. So it's really just a matter of putting it out there. Now, to your larger question, um, how, do you, how do you get people to want to talk about this? I think that we've reached a watershed moment, um, at least within on the right, uh, regarding wanting to accept a fuller notion of constitutional liberty and a more active a, a role of the court that's more engaged um, in reviewing these things, and I tell you, you know, I, I, you know what I think did it. I think Justice Roberts, Obamacare, the second Obamacare opinion, you know, where he bent over backwards to defer to the federal government, even to the point in time where he's going to allow the IRS to do the exact opposite of what the law said just because he didn't want to overstep his bounds. And ever since that moment in time, you have had conservatives say, we've been using this term judicial activism because we hate abortion or whatever, gay marriage, um, and we may we may have gone overboard on that. Um, and we actually think now that we, we, we may not need to start seriously reconsidering our rhetoric on that and to seriously begin to engage with the fact that the people who came to this country were very serious about placing restraints on government. That was the point of the constitutions, and they're meant to be taken fairly literally, um, mm. they're not suggestions. Yeah. People are eager for that argument right now. Uh, hold on now, just so I'm clear, I'm understanding you. Are you saying that there's an increasing awareness um, among conservatives that they need to start actually? Uh, making cases for smaller government rather than government where they want it. Absolutely, yes. Uh, and I think that there's there's starting to be a convergence between libertarian jurisprudence and conservative jurisprudence. Um, now that's so that's interesting. So I, so you're saying there that you feel that until recently, um, and correct me if I've misunderstood this, but that conservative jurisprudence wasn't really being conservative. Well. Conservative. There was definitely an element of selectivity in, engaged in some forms of conservative jurisprudence. Where the big divergence between libertarians and conservatives was was in the role of the courts. Okay. You know, you, you, for most of my life, we've heard conservatives say 
judicial activism, judges, mind your role, don't second guess the legislature. And the libertarians have been the ones out there saying the role of the courts is to second guess the legislature. And that's what the Constitution are designed to do. And, you know, that we shouldn't think too much of it when a court comes in and slaps the hand of the government and says you can't do it. So in other um, words, so, so, so in that case, then conservatives now are all of a sudden getting more interested in these state constitutions as a means f- uh, to allow the courts to do just that. To put the legislators I, I, back in there. Yeah, I think they they fundamentally are increasingly willing to accept the libertarian view of the role of the courts and the necessity of the courts, and they're just grasping for a cohesive um, intellectual architecture. And I think state constitutions are mm, a great way to get them there, um, because it's relatively unplowed ground um, compared to the U.S. Constitution, which you know has two hundred years of good and bad jurisprudence attached to it. There isn't a ton of jurisprudence attached to the state constitutions. So does that mean then that they are, I almost want to say, less messed up as a mechanism for the preservation of liberty across America? I, I think that's I think that's absolutely accurate to say, right. Oh, that's fascinating. And that's not to say that, that courts haven't done their very best to, to bury state constitutions too. But it's still better, it's still less of a cluttered playing field than... Um, than the U.S. Constitution is. So when it comes to state constitutions, we're dealing more with the letter of the basic law, the Constitution, than with the case law and the precedent set, right? That's really what we're talking about. Yeah, the, the, the body of case law that you've got to hack your way through to get at what these things really, really mean mm. is much, it's a much smaller universe. This is wonderful. So do you know... Of, I mean, obviously, we've mentioned Goldwater. Are there any other organizations like Goldwater, like your organization, the Beacon Center in Tennessee, um, that are kind of doing just this? That you know, they're doing litigation. Yeah. Well, yeah. And, and kind of w- in this paradigm, in the yeah. okay, we're going to the state constitutions. We've got this fantastic tool for liberty that, as I say, has been sitting in the box. We're taking it out of the box after one or two hundred yeah. years, right? Is it, is that going on anywhere else that you know of? Any other organizations? Yeah, I think it's a. It's a. I do think is this kind of a breakout moment for conservative libertarian jurisprudence in that regard. Um, and a lot of state organizations are doing it. The Mackinac Center in Michigan does wonderful work. Right. Um, 1851 Constitutional Law Center, which is in Ohio, does great work. They do almost exclusively litigation. Um, I mentioned an organization in Mississippi that uh, just opened up recently, the Mississippi Center for Justice. Um, and they're, they, they, they're younger than, than we are, and they've already got like five great cases um, out there in the pipeline, too. Um, Southeastern Legal in Georgia is another organization I'm familiar with. Um, okay. And so there's a lot of these these things starting to, to move. And what about uh, – so that's kind of litigation, legal side. What about the cultural side? Do you feel – I mean you've talked about – you feel a shift in, let's say, the right in, in the conservative movement, the libertarian movement perhaps. Um, do you feel a shift in America more generally in this regard? I mean, I think that I think that there is the shift in the sense that I think that people are hungry um, in, to start having a serious discussion about the role of government in everyday life. And I do think that the sharing economy has been a wonderful yeah. cultural inflection point for having people rethink a lot of their conventional views about the way the economy is supposed to work and the government's ability to regulate it. Um, you know, I mean, w- when we were looking for the right people to present our Airbnb case, I talked to a lot of, you know, East Nashville hipsters driving Priuses and <laughs> coffee shops. And I mean, these are not people that you would conventionally think are Republicans or, or conservatives or libertarians or any of them. You would sit down and have the discussion with them and they would talk about, you know, how great Airbnb was, free of regulation. You know, spontaneous order. It worked for everybody. It was naturally self-regulating and self-governing. There's better access to information and information sharing than government could ever do. And then questioning why is government getting involved? You know, it seems like they just want money. 
and they're and they're and they're acting at the behest of concerned economic parties who are co-opting the political process. And you can see people on the left, on the right, millennials, older folks. You can see them yeah. all getting that, which is obviously the yeah. case. You and and feeling there's something. This doesn't pass the smell test. There's something kind of corrupt about yeah. this. Something unjust. You, you, yeah. I watched countless number of millennials walk through that process. And then just say, you know, I don't understand why we need a law. And, you know, it was all I could do to just stand there and be like, are you ready to talk about health care yet? <laughs> you know, um, has it ever occurred to you we might be able to say the same thing about something that matters a lot more than, you know, taxi cabs? So let me ask you about that. We've got, I don't know, two and a half minutes left in this segment. Um, so sure. this is, a, a, I don't have a long time to answer what could be uh, actually answered in a very long time. But does... Does this fact, this thing that you're seeing, that you're experiencing as you're making the cases you make in the culture with folks like this, do you see that, you talked about millennials, that this realization is changing their politics? Is it changing their politics? Have you actually had the chance to say to any of them, ask them that question about, and are you ready to talk healthcare yet? And if so, what reaction do you get? I mean, in just a couple of minutes, can you speak to that? Yeah, you know, I you know, I would never I don't know if it's changing who people are voting for or whatever, but I will say that I do think particularly sharing economy type issues, the left right dichotomy dichotomy is totally broken down. Mm. Right? Like, you know, um I, I would say that there's a much better chance that Jerry Brown and Cory Booker would be on board with sharing economy or healthcare innovation occurring outside the scope of the FDA and the conventional, you know, hospital cartel than, say, the governor of Georgia, you know, um, which just cracked down on a really innovative healthcare company um, that's, that has the potential to revolutionize uh, eye care. Um, and you, you, it just does not break down along conventional um, left-right lines. Yeah. It's very interesting. So, and, and so is it more about, you know, those who have an interest in crony control of politics and regulation versus everybody else. Is that the line? It may be. You know, I think it, 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 the closest I could come to giving you a line is I think it really ties to youth. Now, having said that, Jerry Brown's not exactly young, but, you know, um, I've seen plenty of older conservative people who are just innately uncomfortable with total freedom in a right. sharing economy type issue but plenty of younger liberal types who are perfectly comfortable mm. you know, sleeping on the couch of a total stranger mm. that, you know, some app hooked them up with. Yeah. So, I mean, age is maybe the, the biggest marker I've seen on sharing economy type issues. Yeah, you know, and that's interesting because one thing that if cu culture precedes politics and a huge part of culture is actually demographics, you know, and, and ideas die off, right, in two generations yeah. pretty much, right? You right. know, that's just the way of the world. Um this is fascinating. We've only got a few seconds left at the end of this segment. So uh, this is um, – no, I feel I've, I've learned a lot here. And, I, and again, you've given me some kind of optimism um, you know, for liberty. You know, yet another tool in the box, coming out of the box. It's great stuff. Um, now, this will be – this show will be run uh, – pretty much at the new year so happy new year to everybody listening to this when we come back after the break we're just going to plug beacon one more time great Fantastic. this has been another edition of liberty with love with robin kerner on libertytalk.fm check out the archives if you've missed a few of the recent shows all the shows are there on libertytalk.fm in the on-demand section um but before we close out this show back to you Braden um, I love the work you're doing thank you for doing what you're doing uh, if people are interested in your work where can they go to find out more uh, best place is our website beacontn.org that's beacontn as in the state of Tennessee dot org um, we, we try to work very hard to maintain that web, website and curate it with fresh content so there's a lot of writings uh, a lot of blogs a lot of postings on there you can do a deep dive on the cases we're doing, the legislation that we're sponsoring, um, and those sorts of things. And, uh, you know, learn a lot more about what's going on. Um, and we appreciate anybody's support. And are there any other resources that you use, especially with respect to the state constitutions, um, that you could kind of direct non-experts to? Well, you know, um, I, well, maybe when some I books. blog, a lot of times I write about some of these state constitutional issues. I know I've got a couple of blogs in there about um, – 
the anti-monopolies clause and how it matters and some of these things. And of course, my legal pleadings are all posted on there. And so they're mm. available and you'll see a lot of these things discussed in greater detail there. Um, OK, great. And I also just want to flag, we don't really have time to discuss it, but I love the way that you said 200 years of Anglo thought. Anglo is a shorthand that I use. And I'm sure in these days I'm not allowed to do it because it's so un PC. Um, but it really doesn't make us white supremacists. Uh, it's exa- you, you used it exactly as I think it should be used. Um, yeah, these founders I'm think about Adam Smith, John Locke. Oh, I know who you were talking about. Enlightenment era thought. The tradition, yeah, the, the classical liberal. Anglo tradition um, you know these founders they didn't just come up with it uh, you know it, it, it's a lot went into the American constitution um, in a way the American constitution started being written in 1014 with the very first constitutional settlement in the Anglo tradition and then of course we yes. had the Magna Carta and we had um, the, the English Bill of Rights and the Petition of Rights and all this stuff and the guys that wrote the American constitution and many of the state constitutions they had read their history and that's something that I have written about um, extensively so thank you again uh, Braden for kind of uh, bringing all of that great liberal proper sense of the word thought alive in Tennessee great. Wow, my pleasure thank you for having me revolutionary talk for revolutionary times promoting peace liberty and prosperity around the clock libertytalk.fm